Gracious Heavenly Father, I stand in your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, just trusting that you would set this time aside for your glory. We are deeply aware of just how little we know and how foolish some of the things that we, we think and we say really are. I just ask that the Holy Spirit would just filter out any error, filter what's taught, sealing to our hearts truth, so that we grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, whom we love and adore. For it's in his name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the Epistle to the Colossians, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we came to verse 1 of chapter 3. We've gone through two chapters in Colossians, and we're now beginning chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Now, if you remember in the first chapter, we had a, a beautiful presentation of the person and the work of Christ. He's God Almighty. He's creator of heaven and earth. The one who not only spoke the worlds into existence, but the one who holds all things together. And we saw that, that through his work, he created a union so that we might stand holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. The chapter ended then with the Holy Spirit saying that what should be preached is the person and the work of Jesus Christ, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in order that we may present every man complete in Christ. And so much of modern preaching today, at least in the, the last several generations, has really departed from the person and the work of Christ to a message that is not preaching Christ, but is a message to self, from self to self, uh, on law. A legalistic system based on human merit, and that is taken away rather than added to, the, to, to believers' comprehension of his finished work in their lives. It's very rare for you to ever attend any church where that you will hear the message focus on the perfect, finished work of Christ. We continued on looking at the admonishing, the, the warning in chapter 2, that we not let any man be guileless with enticing words. Uh, we've received Christ as a gift. We've received our walk as a gift. Therefore, we walk in Him. Uh, and we are to we're told to beware lest any man spoil you be on your guard lest you be robbed of these truths, the very truths that we've been studying, through some kind of love, of wisdom, and empty deceit. Don't let men put you under condemnation. Don't let anybody judge you in regard to meat or drink and so forth. Don't let any man beguile you, that is, rule against you, you know, rule you unsafe as far as human worship is concerned, detracting from the finished work of Christ. We saw that since we're dead with Christ from the elements of that legalistic world religious system based on human merit, why are we still subject to law, touch not, taste not, handle not? And the chapter ended with a very definite statement. These don't work. They look good on the outside, will worship, human will, false humility. They look good, but they have absolutely no value in the satisfaction of the flesh. And we ended the second chapter. And we see the scriptures, uh, they don't stop with a statement that you co-died with Christ, but you are co-raised with Christ. And folks, that's not just poetry. You know, that simple expression actually defines what's been done for us in Christ. It defines just how close we are in union with Christ, identified with Christ. We are His body. Now, the English would, it would seem to indicate that maybe, you, you, maybe you, you rose with Him and maybe you didn't. The Greek, however, leaves you with no such conclusion. It is not a mood of uncertainty. It's the indicative mood. Since you were really co-raised with Christ, what does it mean to be raised with Christ? 
That's kind of the focus of this uh, message. I know there's a lot of hungry hearts out there. I read your comments and stuff, and and then I know that there are a lot who would, who would, who skip over these videos and they don't find anything uh, that's really thrilling to their heart. But I can't, folks. I can't think of anything more thrilling and exciting than the fact that we were identified with Christ in His death, burial, and His resurrection. We have been raised with Christ. Now, what does that mean? Well, in the first phrase of chapter 3, we have wrapped up in very simple language all of the profound theological truth of the incarnation, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ, and our identification with Him in that death, burial, and resurrection. It's an amazing aspect of truth. It's very dear to my heart, yet it's very, sadly, it's very little understood by modern Christianity. It's so little preached behind pulpits today. It's so little comprehended by Christianity in the main who is scratching around trying to gain favor and merit with God so that they might live better lives and, and be better fit for heaven. First of all, if what modern Christianity says is true, that we, we became identified with Christ when we decided we wanted to be, you know, our death, burial, and resurrection with Christ wouldn't make any sense. We know that we were chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. We are in the One who is eternal. There's, so there's no time. We're looking at a something here that's void of beginning or end. And secondly, you're fit for heaven because Jesus Christ made you righteous. God declared that, that one precept of His character is that he would not call that righteous which was unrighteous, and he wouldn't call that unrighteous which was righteous. Uh, or maybe I hope I said that right. He wouldn't call that that's unrighteous righteous, and he wouldn't call that which is righteous unrighteous. What God does, he does forever. And over the years, I've asked people the question, you know, is there anything God can't do the one thing that, well, we know, uh, most Christians today would agree with you that, that, that there's a lot of things that God can't do. One of the things He can't do is He can't lie. So why is it that we don't hear these same Christians say that God can't call us unrighteous? Third, uh, most of your friends live with a concept of God who is not really sovereign. He's not really in control. And personally, I wouldn't want to think, I mean, I, uh, well, folks, I just, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't want to live uh, with the thought that there was just, even for one second, if there was one second in, in all eternity, you know, if I can use such an expression, where the Almighty God was not in control, Job declared God gives and God takes away, and Christians by the score today say, well, Satan takes it away. Well, God allowed Satan to do that. God said that His will would, would be accomplished in heaven and on earth and in, and in all deep places. If you've lost anything, it's because God took it away. And so these Christians, they seem to leave out the part that Satan does God's will. His will will be done. He declared that it would be done. Now, since you've been raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, God Almighty says to us, and God Almighty said to His people in Proverbs chapter 2, these were God's people, He said that when you seek for Me as one seeks for hidden treasure, then you'll find Me. That's what He said. Folks, how many times have we spent all night wrestling with a single verse of Scripture, wrestling with some concept of the Word of God? How much, just how much is your mind fixed on things that occupy you every day, the ordinary everyday things of, in life? How many times have you done that with God's Word? Seek those things which are above, 
And so why is it we're willing to dedicate our lives to learning other disciplines? We go to school, we learn to become doctors, lawyers, you name it, whatever, golf pro, you know, rodeo pro, whatever. But we don't study, you know. Or saying that we don't need to study. I don't need to study. I, I don't need to labor and pain and difficulty to get the idea of what a simple verse is telling me. You know, we're, we're even willing to pour over a computer manual, you know, until we squeeze all of the enjoyment and use out of it, yet we neglect studying His Word. You know, I used to think that the dumbest thing that I ever ran into was a sheep. And the first time I found that, you know, I found that out on the farm, I was really devastated. You know, the, the, as a little boy in Sunday school, I was taught how wonderful it was that God called me the sheep of His pasture. And and then I grew up and I found out what sheep were, how just how filthy and and uh, ignorant and stupid and dumb they were. And I thought, well, you know, wait a minute, you know, I mean, I'd rather be called a pig. No, I need a shepherd. We need a shepherd. You, you folks need a shepherd. And, and God's Word is our shepherd. Christ is the Word, the living Word. And He's our shepherd. He's the great shepherd. This book is our shepherd. Listen, of all the, the animals that God ever made, the sheep needs, any sheep needs a shepherd. And, and I'm not talking about just a shepherd dog. Chapter 2, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Well, got to be something wrong with that verse because, you know, most, most believers I know would say that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are revealed in Christ. doesn't say that. It says that they have been purposely hidden in Christ, and if we're to find them, we will seek them as one searches for hidden treasure. The things above in the text that we're studying here, folks, is the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. The reason Christ is sitting is because His work is done. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ, and that is in, not at, the right hand of God, which denotes He's God of very God. And, you know, the right hand, as opposed to the left, denotes power. The Greeks actually recognize the right hand as wielding the sword, whereas the left hand held the shield. Now, you Greek students out there, if you if you don't believe me, just go look at the original text. He's sitting in the right hand of God, not at it. That makes a difference. Just that one word, little word in the Greek, epsilon nu, in, makes all the difference in the world. Why is that? Well, because all authority has been granted the Son. This is where our affection is to be. And not on things below. The things on the earth is law, the flesh, human merit, walking by sight, not by faith, uh, going by our feelings, allowing our emotions and feelings, you know, to evaluate our position before God, our standing before God, by what we see and feel as opposed to the truth of, of God's Word. That life, our life, is our life is hidden with Christ in God as a great treasure is hidden in a field. And we come to verse 4, and of course every Christian knows what that is. That's, every Christian knows what that's saying. I mean, that's got to be talking about the rapture and our being in heaven with Christ. And folks, I'm going to suggest, you know, and here I go slaughtering another sacred cow. I'm going to suggest something a little different. I don't think it fits the context. The whole entire chapter of chapter 3, this whole entire chapter is, is talking about our walk, our life, our relationship with Him here below. And I don't think that the Holy Spirit's going to interrupt that whole train of thought by interjecting some statement that has to do with something so obvious as, as most as what every Christian knows. And that's, well, he's coming back again and we're going to be with him. That's, that's not what I'm seeing in the text, folks. And I'll, I'll try to explain this the best as, 
as best as I know how. And uh, as as usual, I'll just point out that I don't don't believe anything that just because I believe it. I'm just saying that this is what I see in the text. You need to search these things daily to see if these things be so. So I'm going to suggest that it's not what that verse is saying at all, given the context of the chapter. The Holy Spirit wrote it in Greek, and He wrote it in a way where He expects me, with diligence and study, to be able to understand it, at least to understand some of it. The Greek language defines its own terms quite remarkably, and it follows certain rules of grammar. The rules of interpretation need to be followed. Context needs to be observed. You know, that's one of the major observations on our part. That, that does not allow me to just fill in the blanks where I simply assume that it says what I think it says or it must be saying, you know, by some superficial reading of the verse. I haven't really applied myself much to that verse when I do that. The same rule applies to our setting our affection on things above, not on things on the earth. So, I mean, so what, sh so what am I supposed to do there? Fill in the blanks, right? What, what, what is it I ought to see? You know, streets of gold, some nice cabin by a lake, a uh, pasture full of pretty horses. That's been one of mine. Uh, um, green golf courses, you name it, whatever. You know, a pond stocked full of largemouth bass, uh, black Angus chicken wings. Come on, I mean, you can you can just come up with all kinds of things. Should I fill in the blanks, okay? Or should should I look at the context? What the things above are, what the things beneath are. I don't think so. I think the things above are just what we've been studying. I think the things below are just what we've been studying. And I think it's beautiful. God is intimately and He's personally concerned in the affairs of your life. God desires that you be comforted. God wants you to know that you're complete in Christ. God wants you to concentrate on the finished work of Christ. That's where your peace is at, folks. I'm going to suggest that the things which are above are the person and the work of Christ, not on how glorious heaven will be. I think we all know that, that it will be. I think we're seeking the revelation of God in the person and the work of Christ, and that's where our mind is to be, and that for a reason. In Galatians, if you have not died to the law, you cannot live unto God, and the human merit-based system out that door of mine says that if I don't do all this stuff, I'm not living a good Christian life, and their idea of, of immorality and corruption and the flesh and all that is a little different than what my book says here. It's a little different than what's so often stressed in many a sermon. We are not under law, but we're under grace. The text says that we are to what we're to avoid is found within that world religious system based on human merit. Touch not, taste not, handle not. Law in your walk alongside Christ. This passage that we're looking at is not addressed to the non-elect. It's addressed to those of you who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. You're either walking, concentrating on where your feet land and on whether you're obeying this or that or the other thing, the commandments of men, or, or you're concentrating on the finished work of Christ. Because this will determine where that you stand before God at the judgment seat of Christ. Everybody's anxious for Him to come, I know. Okay? Me too. But I've always found it disappointing that after nothing happened, after the Revelation 12 sign, and we kind of got, for lack of a better expression, left here for a while, nobody seems to, under, to, to, to care much really, about how we are going to stand before Him when He does appear. So, we continue on. 
but we need to be concentrating on the finished work of Christ because this will determine the outcome of it all, folks. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Now, you know, look, let's be fair. Let's just be fair. How many of you are saying that, that when you sin, it, it's not you that sins, but sin which dwells in you, as Paul said? How many? Handful? A lot? I, I don't know. How many of you are resting in the truth that God is not imputing men's trespasses unto, unto them? How many of you know that your sins are removed as far as the east is from the west, buried in the deepest sea, cast behind his back, sought for, not found, remembered no more, washed as white as snow, and if that's all of you, well, then why do I so often hear, oh, Steve, if you just knew what I did or what I've done, don't want to know. If you just knew that guilt that bothers me. if the, Folks, if there is any guilt at all in your life, you are saying that what God said is not true. You're saying that the work of Christ is not finished. Seeking those things which are above is the person in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on your behalf. It is extremely difficult, folks, especially in this world that we live in, in this body of flesh that we live in, to comprehend, truly comprehend, the grace of God. It's in, inconceivable that our Christian life is not based upon at least some aspect of human merit and human pr production, but folks, it is not. It is not. The realm, the sphere in which we walk is in the person of Jesus Christ and His finished work revealed in the grace of God. And this is what I've tried to impress upon you ever since I began this aspect of blessedhopeforever.com. I have a, a, a heart for you folks. It is genuine. And it, it is sincere. I want you to know the peace of God that, that, that passes understanding. I don't want you carrying around a load of guilt. Jesus himself would have you drop the, those bricks, drop the load. He's neither equipped nor in t a load that he neither equipped nor intended that you carry, folks. I think the hardest thing to do is just simply believe Him and trust Him that what He said is true. Not go by our feelings, not, not go by uh, what we see in our lives and what others might, how others might interpret our lives. Seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. And I don't have time to go into that, but just look at the concept of sitting in the Word of God. You know, what we're taught in Leviticus is that if one of God's children, and believe me, they, in Leviticus was addressed to God's children, whom he had redeemed out of Egypt. If, just, if one of God's children sits in the area of the flesh, he is unclean. Are we resting in the production of the flesh or the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ? That's what it comes down to, folks, in the end. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was, was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. The Word wasn't always flesh. God Almighty became incarnate in human flesh. It is the incarnation who now sits at the right hand of God. The problem in our minds, well, we immediately paint this picture, you know, we have some kind of, of a, we see some kind of golden throne with emeralds and rubies and rainbows you know surrounding it and and god almighty you know sitting there in flowing robes and a long white beard you know and then you got the lord jesus christ he's a little smaller than than god and he's sitting at his right hand and folks that's not the picture that we're to get from the language that's used here 
It is the incarnation who is resting because his work is finished. All that was involved in God's program and plan for you is done as far as eternity is concerned. His work is finished. He sits at the right hand of God. In chapter 2, we were told that in him dwelleth all the fullness of the deity in bodily form. It was the sinless, righteous Son of God that rose from the dead, and you, whom God has made righteous and, 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 and is co-raised with him, to walk in newness of life, his life, you too are righteous, as righteous as Christ. Amazing. When he died, folks, you died. When he rose, you rose to walk in his work, his finished work. The works that he prepared, God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We don't walk in our own works. We walk in the finished work of Christ. And because we do that, Christ is manifest in and through our lives by faith. And all of a sudden, and by the way, that, that is a favorite word of mine, manifest. Manifest. We're not copies. We're not Xerox copies of Jesus. You know, he actually lives his life in and through our lives by faith. A real person the God of the universe, the one who spoke the worlds into existence, who hung the stars in the sky, actually lives his life in and through you. That's not poetry, folks. That's real. That's what he says. Uh, so, Christ is manifested and through our lives by faith. And all of a sudden, the fourth verse is beginning to make sense given the context. Because the Greek says, when Christ who is our life shall appear, maybe he will, maybe he won't, subjunctive mood. It's not the indicative mood, folks. It is the subjunctive mood. You, you Greek students, look at it, okay? It's in the mood of uncertainty. Maybe he, he will, maybe he won't appear. And I hope I haven't lost you there, but the grammar does not grant us the liberty to throw in the word rapture there. May be revealed is the word in the Greek, and it's in the mood of uncertainty. To make clear, to make visible, to make manifest, that's what the text is saying. We're still, the Holy Spirit hasn't left the thought of our walk here in our relationship with here, with him here below, uh, sanctification, the issue of spiritual life and growth. He hasn't, Holy Spirit, his mind didn't take a, a sudden departure to, to the rapture in heaven, an obvious truth that we all you know, know anyway, just to come back and spend the rest of the chapter talking about the same walk and life and, and grace and the finished work of Christ and all that and so on and so forth. That's not what I'm seeing in the text. And I'm simply looking at the words honestly and, and I'm looking at the grammar and I'm comparing Scripture with Scripture here. 2 Corinthians 2.14 But thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph in Christ and makes manifest the fragrance of His knowledge by us in every place. Philippians 1.13 So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all be made manifest before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he's done. 2 Corinthians 4.10 A favorite verse of mine, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That's in us. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Hello. And our verse says, when Christ who is our life shall be made manifest, be revealed, become visible. In the same sense in which the Word describes Christ who is the Word became manifest, the same is true of us before God as well as others. Christ manifest. 
Christ revealed. If we force rapture into this verse, it becomes foreign to the entire context of the chapter, which from beginning to end is instruction concerning how we're to walk in light of the fact that His work on our behalf is finished. Raised with Christ. We ascended into heaven as a resurrected body in Christ. Marvelous truth, folks. That isn't poetry. It's fact. Furthermore, we're actually co-seated with Christ in the heavenlies, if you remember back in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, verse 6, if you remember. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. That verse, Ephesians 2, 6, ties directly into what we're looking at here. He rested from his work as we have also rested from ours. Hebrews 4, 10. Take a look at the 10th verse of the 4th chapter of Hebrews. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. That's, that's talking about our works. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. And folks, it's, now there's a reason why the word labor is there. It's not easy. It's not easy to rest in his works to cease from our own works and rest in His. But that's the only place, folks, that you're going to find rest. The flesh profits nothing. And so the rest of the verse says, Then shall ye also appear with Him in glory. And, well, though the grammar makes it clear that this is a future tense, the Holy Spirit could have simply used the word heaven, but He didn't. Folks, He didn't use the word heaven. He said glory. So let's look at that real quick. Since Christians tend to throw you know, glory around all the time as if it always means heaven. It always just means a place, heaven. I have no doubt that the future tense includes heaven. I'm just noting that the word is not heaven. The word heaven in the Greek is suranos. The word glory is doxa. Two entirely different words with two entirely different meanings. The word glory means honor, renown, splendor, exercising personal opinion which determines value. The term conveys the thought of God's infinite intrinsic worth, substance, essence. The word doxa, glory, literally means what evokes good opinion. That's, that is something has inherent intrinsic worth. In short, folks, what the word glory means, the, glo the word glory means to have a proper estimation of something's worth or value. Now read the verse. When the Christ may be revealed, maybe you will, maybe you won't, the life of you then also you with him will be, absolutely, without a doubt, in glory. Folks, life is only realized on the resurrection side of the cross. Therefore, I, I seek, I inquire concerning the power of Christ's work being finished on my behalf. I don't mind telling you that my daily life, my very ex existence, in fact, is a constant seeking of truth concerning the marvelous fact of Christ's finished work on my behalf in my life. My affections are on Christ. That's where they should be. Your affections should be on Christ. Not self, not the law, not the flesh, not the world, not human merit. This life that I live is preserved. It's hidden with Christ in God. Hidden, hidden as, as a treasure that I have to seek out if I'm just to, to discover that treasure, that life, that, that treasure being my life in Christ. 
And it's on this basis that if Christ is revealed, manifest, made known to me or, or to others in this life, maybe you will, maybe you won't. The text is saying, folks, that, that we will be nevertheless, re, whether he is or he isn't, because we are his, his children, because we are children of God, the text is saying we will be revealed with him in glory, in honor and splendor. This can only be saying one thing. We will stand before God someday as who we are, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight, which is what we are now. Whether we realized it in this life or not, which takes my mind back to the beginning of chapter 2 where God stated that the great conflict that He has for us is that our hearts would be comforted. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I appreciate you all, each and every one of you. I appreciate your, your prayers, your support. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.